Notre Dame put on one of its most dominant performances in school history on Saturday against Purdue, so obviously there was plenty to like about that game. But they still need to improve in several key areas, and it starts at the quarterback position. That's all coming right up. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome into another edition of Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. And I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018 and now I'm a producer at Fox Sports. And I appreciate you joining me here on Tuesday, September 17th. And thank you for making this your first listen of the day. As always, you can watch a full episode on YouTube or you can listen wherever you get your podcasts. Quick reminder to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you are watching on YouTube or rate, review, and subscribe on your preferred podcast platform. Today's episode is brought to you by Fandle. Now through September 22nd, all Fandle customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Just visit Fandle.com to get started. Okay, it's Tuesday of game week, which means we got Luke Smith back on the show to provide our final thoughts on Notre Dame's blowout win over Purdue. We're going to cover everything that we liked and didn't like from this one. And considering the dominant nature of Notre Dame's win, there was a lot more to like than dislike. But we do have to address the bad breaks they got in the injury front now that we have the official word from Marcus Freeman on the severity of those injuries. But this was a lot of fun, as always, and I hope you enjoy it. Luke, I got to say, personally, I am in much better spirits today than I was at this time last week. But from what I could tell, I think I might be in the minority here because I've seen a lot of Notre Dame fans who still aren't very pleased, despite the fact that the Irish just handed Purdue their worst defeat in program history. So how would you describe your mindset right now about this Irish team coming off that big win on the road? It's strange. I've also never seen a 59 point win elicit such strong reaction and and not necessarily in a positive manner. Um, but I, I can also, to be fair, say that I, I kind of understand it given just the flop that was the week before. So not completely innocent in that um, while I'm trying to still appreciate how historic and lucky not lucky. How lucky I feel that that win happened. I think all I texted you before that game was, can we just get a stress-free game for once? And, and we got that and then some. So um, I'm gl- grateful that that happened. And I don't anticipate the same next week because if there's anything I've learned from the Marcus Freeman era, it's to expect the unexpected. Yeah, what you see one week is likely not what you're going to see the next week. So who knows what's going to happen when Notre Dame faces off against Miami, Ohio. But let's stay on this Purdue game because that's actually the first thing that I liked. It's really simple. Notre Dame was winning 42 to nothing at halftime, and they did not take their foot off the gas. As you and I had discussed, I didn't even think a stress-free game was even possible from Mm -hmm. this group. And that might have been the most stress-free game of all time. I understand fans' frustration about the Northern Illinois loss. That's not going away anytime soon. But that level of dominance against a Power 4 opponent is unheard of. And I understand that Purdue is terrible They are probably going to finish dead last in the Big Ten. I have no idea if Ryan Walters is the guy there because he had Hudson Card in there just taking abuse very late in the game when the game was well out of reach for his team. So I think what they did in that game was really, really special. And going into this game, you and I had joked really all offseason that the Purdue game was not going to be fun. It was going to be ugly, and it was going to be unenjoyable. And that's exactly how I felt, especially after that loss in Northern Illinois. And it was the complete opposite of every Notre Dame-Purdue game that we have grown up watching. So they, the offense set the tone of the opening drive. The defense responded by basically eliminating any hope for Purdue. And they managed to outscore Purdue 24-7 to in the second half with the backups in. I could not have even dreamt of a performance that was that dominant from the starters and the backups. And for all the complaints out there, and I get them, it was very nice to just enjoy a stress-free Saturday for the first time in a long time. It really was. And I was nervous that I wasn't going to be able to do that at all. And and, in fact, I thought another wedding was going to get thrown in jeopardy. Um, (laughs) And and when I walked into the church on Saturday night at the wedding I was at, it was 28 to nothing. So that was fantastic. But there were about four minutes left in the first half. So when I looked at my phone at like pretty much the end of the mass and saw it was 42 to zero at halftime, I was like, how did that happen? Um, And then I saw just the two 
maybe most horrific plays I've ever seen from a team, both on an interception and then just giving up as Notre Dame was attempting to run out the clock. And uh, it made a lot more sense, but I'm glad that that was the case on Saturday. How would you describe your general mood during this wedding compared to last week? Were you a much better hang this time around? You know, I actually think I was not a terrible hang in the, during the first one because it was still like it was a good friend and whatever. I just tried to forget, though. He just lost to freaking NIU. Uh, but I think, generally speaking, yes, my mind was more at ease during this one. Um, and thankfully, one of the other guys there was also a huge Notre Dame fan, so I didn't feel like a degenerate being the only one on my phone as we were in the lead-up to the wedding. So that was good. All right, what's the first thing that you like from this one? So I like the quarterback play, and – it's almost like uh, if we could put like a three headed monster on these guys and like maybe have like Kenny Minchie's arm and like Steve Angeli's, I don't know, accuracy. I'd, so let's say like arm uh, liveliness, Kenny Minchie, Steve Angeli, like accuracy and Riley Leonard's legs. That would be a pretty darn good quarterback. Now, of course, you can't do that, but I really did like what I saw from Leonard on the ground. And, and I guess it makes it even more apparent that he must have been hurt the week before because he was running a lot and often and Purdue. Well, one, they didn't have any chance to stop him, but two, it, the way they tried to tackle, it didn't seem like they wanted to stop him either. So I'll start with the quarterback play. I thought that was really solid um, from all three guys. And, and then seeing CJ Carr in, in victory formation as well was a nice little cherry on top. Do you feel more? or less confident about Riley Leonard going forward after this game, or really this half against Purdue, because he only played one half. You'd like to think that he would have thrown a touchdown pass in the second half if he had gotten out there, but I don't know if that's true. <laughs> um, I, I just don't. And like part of me honestly wants to, in a sadistic way, see how long this can go without him throwing <laughs> a touchdown pass. Like it's, I, I'm kind of half miffed at Angeli for breaking that streak. Uh, I don't know. He he kind of looked like what I thought he was, and I don't know if that's going to work against half competent, well coached defenses that just play zone uh, and don't man Notre Dame up like Purdue did, kind of inexplicably, and then just let him run all over the place. But um, I thought he played well, and this is kind of what I expected him to be. And well, I hope that there's still some room for growth in the passing game. We haven't seen that yet, and like there is some legitimate cause for concern there. Yeah, I think the real concern is the lack of wide receivers getting involved in this one because the tight ends were actually very involved. Eli Raritan got out there. He made some nice catches. First time he was a factor at all this season. Mitchell Evans in limited action made some plays as well. Then Cooper Flanagan had the touch on there. But the fact that we had spent really all offseason, particularly when talking about recruiting, how Notre Dame has struggled to recruit wide receivers, we thought that this season would be a big step forward so that the wide receivers could really produce and it'd become a more appealing yeah. destination for wide receivers. That has not happened yet, and the big reason why is Notre Dame has not been able to pass the ball downfield effectively. I thought it was hilarious when Steve Angeli immediately threw a passing touchdown because fans were already calling for Steve Angeli to start, and when that happened, I was like, oh, it's game over. And then Steve Angeli completes the best pass of the season to Jane Harrison, although I will point out that Riley Leonard did make that same exact throw to Jane Greathouse. He just happened to drop the ball. Jane Harrison caught it. But I knew that would just basically fan the flames and fans would get even more riled up. So I think Notre Dame has made it very clear. Like, they're rolling with Riley Leonard. So for as much as fans want to, like, champion Steve Angeli and say that he should start, I think that they have a case to be made for sure, but it's just not going to happen. And I think we all have to accept that at this point. I would agree, and I, I don't know, honestly, that it should happen either. Although, like, I love the fact that Angeli can throw the ball and, like, look like a modern offense to some degree. He kind of surprised me a little bit with, I'm not going to say lack of mobility, but just, like, some poor decisions back there, taking some bad sacks. And, and I know that it was backups in for Notre Dame, but um, that surprised me a little bit. And, like, that's something that, as a starting quarterback, you you can't do. So, I think that, especially with the progression of Notre Dame's offensive line, which is going to be very patchwork moving forward, you might need Riley Leonard back there just to run around a little bit. So um, now if, if you told me Kenny Minchie was the guy, I might be a little bit more excited about that. But I, I think as frustrating as it may be, um, everybody's public enemy number one, Riley Leonard, is going to remain the, uh, the starting quarterback here. <laughs> Dude. 
<laughs> Notre Dame fans hate Riley Leonard. Crazy. It's wild. It yeah. feels personal to me. It does. And like, let me tell you from personal experience, <laughs> there have been far more hateable quarterbacks <laughs> that have come through that campus than this guy who seems to be just a God fearing Christian. And maybe that's why people don't like him. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I think it probably has to do with the money that uh, was paid to bring him in here, but it wasn't your freaking money. Like most of these people. So why do they care? It's the money. It's the fact that he's a one year mercenary player and the most important thing is that Notre Dame lost to Northern Illinois. But like, yeah. while I admit, Riley Leonard played terribly, especially in that second half against Northern Illinois, he should not have been out there. Like that is on the coaching staff more than Riley Leonard. I actually respect the fact that he wanted to go out there and gut it out. And yeah, in hindsight, should he probably have just been like, hey coach, I, clear, I clearly can't go here. I can't do what this offense needs to do. Yeah, it's easy for us to say that, but he's a competitor in the heat of, a, of the moment. He's a captain. By taking yourself out, he's effectively letting his team down. And if he did that, guess what? He would get criticized probably just as much for right. quitting on his team in that moment. So I respect him for going out there, but obviously his play was not good enough. And now because of that, fans basically blame the entire game on him. And while I understand that he obviously played a big part in it, I just don't put the blame on him. I put it on the coaches for letting him go out there when it was very clear that he was not healthy and they didn't run him. And that's literally the best thing he can do for this offense right now is to run. And the fact that they didn't do it against Northern Illinois showed that he wasn't healthy. So I don't know. I think it's gotten extreme. It's honestly gotten a little weird from some fans. And I understand if you don't want Riley Leonard to be the starter, that's one thing. But the hate that is going towards him right now from the Notre Dame fan base is a little much. It's weird, um, but th there are a lot of weird people that follow this sport, unfortunately. Um, and I think I would be lying if I said that Riley Leonard has totally met my expectations through three games. And, and a lot of that is just because of the stain of the NIU loss. But I think you raise a really good point. He shouldn't have been out there in that game. And I think something that's been swept away with the passage of time and just how reactionary everything is in the sport he won them the Texas A&M game. Like they, <laughs> they went down 85 yards with him completing two huge passes, using his legs to pick up a first down as well in a tie ball game on the road in the like what's been deemed the most hostile environment in the country. He is the reason that they won that game. He drove them down the field, and, and that's like already forgotten about. So while he didn't play a perfect game that night either, like you got to give credit where credit's due, and it just like some of the uh, the vitriol is just like whoa, relax yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I totally understand being critical of Ryan Leonard mm -hmm. as a passer. Like, he has not done enough. The fact that he hasn't thrown a passing touchdown is concerning. He has not been accurate. He doesn't look confident. But clearly, what the staff sees from him every day in practice, in meetings, and all of that, they believe that Riley Leonard is the guy to take them to where they need to be. And they obviously need to get more out of him, specifically as a passer, but they have faith in themselves to get that out of him. And, and Notre Dame really does need Riley Leonard to step up a little bit. And I think that's why Marcus Freeman was like, you're our guy. You're our guy. Mike Denbrock is doing everything he can to make this work. But I actually, that leads me into my next thing that I liked because I thought Notre Dame's use of 21 personnel was great in this game with two running backs on the field at the same time. It was great to see that new wrinkle to the offense. I'd honestly thought we'd see it a little bit more up to this point in the season but I'm glad that Notre Dame put in Jeremiah Love and Shadarian Price at the same time because when you have those two plus Riley Leonard in the backfield, like that is a legit three-headed monster in the backfield. And yeah, Leonard, there's some concerns there about his throwing ability, but those are three elite runners. And for all the complaints about his passing, we should acknowledge that he did have some really impressive runs in this game. And with Love and Price and him all in the backfield, that's a lot for the defense to have to take into account. So Notre Dame should be able to run the ball at will with all three of those guys. And they're healthy because Love is just so good, man. And even when he's not in the play, they would motion him out of the backfield and you could just see Purdue's entire defense shift to cover him basically and it creates more running lanes for price and uh riley leonard so that's a fun new wrinkle i hope to see a lot more of that going forward it is and i'm glad that you brought up jeremiah love there because notre dame has really been talented or <clears throat> sorry notre dame has really been blessed with a lot of talented backs over the last decade 
I mean, Kyron Williams might be my favorite player to ever wear a gold hat. And I, I really love Dexter Williams. And that's not even mentioning Audric Estime and Josh Adams. But to be totally truthful, I, I don't think there's been a guy like number four that I can remember in my lifetime. Just the ability to turn it on and go and just break a touchdown from anywhere on the field. Um, it's not something we've seen that often. Um, and that's with you know, a teammate who has two 45 plus yard touchdown runs this year in Jadarian Price. But there's something about the way that Jeremiah Love moves and runs out there that is incredibly smooth. And thank God he is just a sophomore and has to come back next year because, man, he's going to be fun to watch over the next year and a half. Without a doubt. And he's already established himself as one of the best players on the entire team, not just the offense. It's one of those takes that you have during the offseason. I think you and I were aligned on this. We thought that, yes, losing Audric Esme is a, is a big blow for sure, but the combination of love and price could actually end up being more productive for this offense. I think that's especially true, considering the fact that this offensive line is going to go through some growing pains this year, and both those guys, they don't need much space to make a big play. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and and they might have to make plays. They've already done it already this year, but um, they're going to have to moving forward, I think, with with the mixing and matching on the offensive line. Luke and I still have plenty more to get to, so he'll be right back here with me in a second. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about a new sponsor we have here at Locked On Irish called Roy. It stands for Return On You, and it's a new platform that lets you, the fans, get involved in NIL like never before by making contributions directly to your favorite athletes. By supporting players directly, you can help shape rosters, retain talent, and keep your favorite athletes out of the transfer portal. As you all know, NIL has changed the game for athletes. Well, Roy changes the NIL game for fans. Roy allows fans to directly back their favorite college athletes. And with Roy, fans can play a key role in shaping the future of their favorite teams while athletes maximize their name, image, and likeness potential. Fans' contributions are securely held and are only distributed if the athlete makes the decision that aligns with the fan support. If not, the money is returned to the fan. Download Roy for iOS or Android and enter referral code Locked On, and you'll automatically be entered into a sweepstakes to win $5,000 cash. Visit joinroy.com for additional details. No purchase necessary, void where prohibited. Get the Roy app for iOS or Android and start making an impact on your favorite team. Use referral code Locked On for an opportunity to win $5,000 cash. Visit joinroy.com for more details. No purchase necessary, void where prohibited. Get off the sidelines and into the NIL game with Roy. All right, what else you got? So my last one is just, it seems like week in, week out, we're seeing a healthier Mitchell Evans. He had three catches for 27 yards, but some of those were tough catches, and I just think he's easing himself back into it, and I really hope he's at full tilt by the time Louisville comes to town because they're going to need him, and that's a guy who can really bail Riley Leonard out uh, if he needs to, especially on third downs. I mean, the guy is incredibly talented, and especially for a guy who's played tight end for – this is his third year playing tight end. He's a high school quarterback. Um, I, I think Mitchell Evans might end up being a guy where he has a tremendous NFL career. And you're going to look back at his college statistics and be like, oh, he was all right. But I think this is going to be a guy that in the pros, he could be a stud, granted that he stays healthy. You know who he reminds me of a little bit? Hmm. Cole Komet. And speaking mm -hmm. of, I think that that Louisville game is going to be like Mitchell Evans is coming out party this year because – like you said, he's been playing a little bit, and obviously Notre Dame fans know all about Mitchell Evans. He broke out last year, but I feel like the general college football world is not really aware of just how good he is. But that Louisville game in a couple weeks, you know, assuming Notre Dame just gets by Miami of Ohio, which I probably shouldn't assume at this point, but I yeah, don't expect don't. him to be at full health in that game. There's no training wheels. It's full go for him from the start. And I think that game, he's going to play a lot like Cole Komet did in 2019 against Georgia. He'd missed the first couple of games because he suffered an injury in preseason camp that year. And from the first drive, it was like, oh, that's the Cole Komet. That was the five-star tight end that just really hasn't played that much at Notre Dame. He finished that game with nine catches, 108 yards, and a touchdown. And he was one of the best players on the field going up against the Georgia defense and had like six future NFL guys. I think we're going to see that from Evans against Louisville. I'm just calling it now. I think that's a really good call, and I would love for that to be the case. Um that said, I guess I also hope that a receiver scores a touchdown by that point in the season too, but that might be too much to ask. Yeah, that <laughs> that'd be nice, but come on, dude, we got we got to be realistic <laughs> I know, here. I know. Yeah, I really I really hope that Jane Greathouse starts to get going here. Like he's 
second on the team in receiving right now. But um, yeah, I mean, he dropped that one. He's had some bad breaks because he had that nice catch um, against Purdue and then it got called back uh, for the holding. But I think we really need a big game for him because it would kind of quiet some concerns about the receiver room as a whole. Definitely. And <clears throat> you're right. I mean, I don't want to get into the recruiting thing right now, but this is not helping that uh, that pre-existing notion out there that Notre Dame doesn't have receivers and, and maybe doesn't even have quarterbacks too. But anyways, <laughs> that's not for this episode. Well, despite the fact that Notre Dame hasn't really recruited receiver really well, they have recruited a lot of other positions really well. And a lot of those young guys showed out in this one. That's the last thing I liked. Notre Dame got to give their backups real reps which I think is very valuable. It's going to matter a lot down the road. It's one thing to come in in the fourth quarter and garbage time for like a series or two and just get out there and be on the field. Like I do think that's beneficial for these guys, but they played the entire second half. It felt yep. like a real game, despite the fact that the stakes are very low. A couple of guys I want to um, shine some light on. Kennedy Urlacher, a lot of talk about him in the last couple of days. I admit I was pretty low on him as a recruit. I thought a big reason why Notre Dame offered him was because of his last name. Well, he looked really good on Saturday. Made some really nice plays. There's this one nice play in the uh, an open field tackle that he made. Greg Flamung, our friend, broke it down on Twitter. And you just watch it again. You're like, wow, that was really impressive. Bryce Young uh, had a good game here. Killed a guy on kickoff return. He's going to have to take on a bigger role now that um, Jordan Botello is out for the season. Kingston Viliamu Asa continues to shine. And K.K. Smith led all skilled players in snaps. And he's a player who's like kind of quietly emerging. They tried to go to him on a couple of deep shots. Notre Dame wasn't able to convert. But keep an eye on him because I think he's going to have a big play here pretty soon. Yeah, maybe he'll be the first receiver to score a touchdown. But um, I agree. And the Kennedy Urlacher thing, granted, Purdue, like it cannot be stated enough. Like maybe the worst power four <laughs> team ever. Um, just like a, a, a misfit miss collection of misfits. Like even they're all American freaking stunk. Um, <laughs> so, so anyways, but I did not expect to see Kenny Kennedy Urlacher even getting that much run. And I, I maybe I should have because he was playing on special teams, but like I was with you, I thought he was one of the, maybe the worst guys in that class. He was and the lowest playing ranked. a lot. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting to see how that progresses. Okay, you kind of led me to it. Let's go over to things we didn't like. One of mine, this is going to be a quick one. My praise of Dylan Thieneman <laughs> in the preview. Uh, he was terrible. And I'm like, not saying awful. he's a terrible player, but it is genuinely shocking that number 31 on Purdue was the Big Ten freshman of the year and was a projected All-American going into this season because I understand that Purdue asked him to do a lot. It's the single high safety. He has to cover a lot of ground. Some plays, they were lining him up like literally 30 yards off the ball. That was kind of insane. Again, don't know the strategies there from Ryan Walters, but he had four missed tackles, which led felt the like team. More. It felt like <laughs> a lot more because they were loud misses. It felt like every time he missed a tackle, it ended up being a touchdown. So again, a lot of responsibility on Dylan Thieneman. But I remember going into the pregame, I'm like, yeah, man, Notre Dame has the key on this guy every single play. When in reality, if they just went at him every single play, that was uh, that would have been a pretty good strategy for the offense. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, it wasn't just you who hyping him up. I mean, the media did a lot, and the video game also did. Like, I, I some year in a dynasty, I ended up playing Purdue in the playoffs, and he had like three picks in that game, just making like Travis Hunter like plays. So they have him way too high in that game, and maybe that'll go down after this week as well. Uh, but as somebody said to me, and this guy's probably going to listen to this show, but like basically, it was like having like a kid from like Fenwick out there, like in the safety, <laughs> just like the, the the tackles were that bad, like the worst missed tackles I have ever seen. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's anything to be to put your head down about that one. He just stunk. Yeah. Loud misses, man. Loud miss and a loud miss for me. What do you got on your first thing you didn't like? So I'm going to go with the fact that our brains are so warped that we can't even fully appreciate a 59 point win on the road against the power four team. And well, I don't have the same hatred in my heart that uh, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of Notre Dame fans seem to particularly towards Riley Leonard. Like, I, I don't know. I, maybe every fan base does this, but just like the fact that I was breaking down anything after that game, like this didn't go well. Like it, it felt greedy. It felt wrong. Um, but that's where we're at. And I think part of that is just getting burned so many times in the past. And, and of course, the NIU debacle that happened the weekend before. Um, 
but yeah, you just like need to work on that relationship so that uh, your my brain is just not trained to think about the negative when your team wins by sixty on the road. Yeah, and I understand the residual effect of losing to Northern Illinois and being the laughing stock of college football for over a week. Like that's not just going to go away immediately, but to be mad at the television while Notre Dame is destroying Purdue just felt odd. And if you become more upset about the effort against Northern Illinois because of what they showed against Purdue, like I, I totally get it, but I think we already kind of knew what this team was capable of. And then Northern Illinois kind of shook up everything. And then I had all kinds of doubts that this team could do anything this season. And I felt at least a sense of relief that like, okay, I don't know how the season is going to go. I don't know if Notre Dame is going to make the playoff. I don't know if they're going to run the table. But at least I know that they have a really talented roster. And at the very least, there should be a lot of fun Saturdays still to come. Now, they obviously have to get some things figured out. But it's a lot better than the alternative. Because if Notre Dame had won that game in like a pretty ugly fashion, not only would I have been down about the game, just I would have been much more down on the team as a whole because they clearly <laughs> produced not that good. So I think that's why I feel better than most because it's like, okay, that was still really bad, but there's still some fun to be had. Yeah, I agree, and that's what I've been trying to do is is see the good in this and just enjoy it because I don't know that there will ever be a game like that again where Notre Dame wins sixty six to seven on the road against the Power of fourteen. So I agree. I mean, the New Mexico win a couple of years ago felt like the biggest blowout ever, and that was actually a smaller margin of victory than what they beat Purdue. What by. was um what was Bowling Green that year? Because I. Like to a man, I I could tell you that I think those two teams are the worst two teams to ever come through Notre Dame Stadium, and it was in the same season. So Notre Dame won that game fifty-two to nothing, but they basically just stopped really trying. They were up thirty-five to nothing at half, as opposed to forty-two. I guess they were trying to go into the half thirty-five to nothing, but uh, that's actually the one game in recent memory that I did not watch like at all live. I didn't catch a second of that game. Because I was at Auburn, Florida, and I mean, I watched the highlights, but I had never been less enthused about a game than that one, maybe ever. Yeah, I I was there. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think it was a pretty pretty boring game, to be totally honest with you. But yeah, that's a uh, it's a throwback for sure. All right, I can't believe we haven't really talked about it yet. Uh, next thing I didn't like: the offensive line is now hanging on by a thread. Mark Freeman sort of confirmed our worst fear on Monday that Ashton Craig is going to be out with a season-ending knee injury. I thought maybe it would be just like a sprain and he'd be able to come back about halfway through because he actually looked okay getting off the fields. But as we know, with ACL injuries, sometimes you don't know. So that's a huge blow to the Notre Dame offensive line. I guess the one bit of good news is that Billy Strouth is only going to be out for a, quote, few weeks. But in Marcus Freeman language, I have no idea what that means. A few weeks could be months. We never really know. But... It is good that he's going to be able to come back and play some this season. And then obviously Jordan Battelle is going to be out for the season. I think we all knew that watching the game. So those are really tough injuries, but specifically on the offensive line. Like on one hand, yes, it is a positive that Pat Coogan and Rocco spend there. The two guys that came in to replace them do have starting experience. Notre Dame is now running out there with without three of their five best linemen. And if they sustain one more injury on that line, things go south in a hurry. Like, they're hanging on right now. They can get by with this group, but there are nine more games left. They cannot afford one more injury on that line. They really can't, and let's be honest. I mean, these two guys are their best two linemen, um, so that's that's no big thing. Uh, or it's no small deal, Nothing. I should say. It is a big thing. But And and if you go, I guess, maybe on potential, with Jagu saw out, like, it's their three best linemen that are out for the year. Uh, or maybe not Shrouth isn't, but... I don't know. Like I, I just don't feel good about that diagnosis from Marcus Freeman. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. Um, there did seem to be some optimism around Craig, but I actually thought in real time that that was the worst injury of all of them. So I, thankfully, didn't get my hopes up on that one. Um, but I do feel good for Coogan and Spindler who stuck around. And I know that the, in theory they lost their jobs late in the game and, and too late to transfer, but seem like guys who've been engaged, good teammates, good leaders, and now they're getting their chance. So we'll see if they rise to the challenge. Um, I thought Spindler played pretty well in reserve on Saturday, but again, Purdue. So who knows? Uh, so that'll be interesting to monitor to moving forward. But yeah, it's uh, 
it's reaching a dangerous, dangerous territory from a depth perspective. Speaking of dangerous, looks like uh, that weapon that Notre Dame has at punter might not be as dangerous as we thought. Yeah, it appears the <laughs> praise around him was greatly exaggerated. Um, <laughs> my worst fears about the punter are looking truer by the week. I, I said this in, was it the preseason awards? I don't know. No, it was by or no, sell. What? It was, I think it was like biggest question marks we had. We did it like late July, early August. And you okay. said, what if the punter just stinks? And then we had heard some really good things about him in camp. And that, so mm-hmm. we basically reversed course. Yeah, it turns out he does stink. Um, <laughs> and uh, this, is, I think, is the risk you run where you have a punter that has never played football before. And that felt really bold to me. And, I mean, we've heard millions of good things around about him. And just coincidentally, I've never seen any of them. Um, but I, I don't know, man. It's It hasn't cost him a game yet. I wouldn't say that he was even necessarily the reason or close to a reason why they lost the NIU game. But, man, he's not good. He's not been good. That is for sure. I have it pulled up right now. So according to ESPN, out of 106 punters in the entire oh, country, God. where do you think James Rendell ranks in terms of average yard per punt out of 106? Wait, how are there only 106 punters in the country? I don't just, know. There's 134 like, schools. But is it, like, maybe, is it like Lincoln Riley and USC just having Caleb like pooch punt? At, or uh, anyways, it appears. Um, so. I'm gonna guess 98. Worse, it's 101. Jeez, he's averaging 37 yards a punt, and I'm honestly surprised. And they all look terrible. Yeah, and Marcus Freeman said in his press conference that the coaches are asking him to do too much. And look, I understand that there's a lot of nuance to being a punter, and that. It's not as easy as it's made out to be. However, what are you asking him to do? Just punt the ball, dude. Like, get some hang time, kick it far. Yeah, and I get, like, not wanting to throw your your player under the bus and maybe giving a guy that hasn't played a ton of football confidence. But, like, Marcus, maybe say something like... Yeah, you know, we're we're working on some things. We're just I, I don't know, we got some mechanics that we're working on. Like nobody knows punting mechanics in the in those <laughs> press conferences who's going to critique that. But they will critique like the fact that you're telling the punter to do too much. So just a thought. Uh there's always learning lessons here, but man, that was that was quite a quote. The thing too about him punting is like it's not like he's had one where he just boots it and you're like, Oh, okay, like that's what they were talking about. Like that's the one where it'll, it'll kind of keep you coming back for more. He hasn't had one. He hasn't had one good punt where you're like, all right, yeah, we just need to do that more often. He is consistent. He's just unfortunately consistently bad. Yeah, I mean, I honestly think John Sott somehow should have just been given all-time eligibility, just all-time punter, because that guy just – I don't think there's a real significant advantage to it. He's just a tremendous punter, and we should have been able to keep keep on him for just forever. I don't, I don't know how you worked that out, but that would have been nice. Maybe the one good thing to come out of that 2022 season was the John Sott experience. And he had to punt a lot because that <laughs> offense really it wasn't was not good. <laughs> it, was, it was not that good. All right, what else you got? So um, I think my last thing is that last week happened um, for a multitude of reasons. Um, one kind of relates to my first piece, just that it makes that performance so much more frustrating. Cause it's like, where is this? But I think the bigger piece is because it's allowed Thomas Hammock to get way too much <laughs> face time and audio time. And I I am like actively rooting against that guy. I, I know that like it's probably in Notre Dame's best interest for NIU to have a good season. But like I hope they go two and ten and he gets fired because he is so <laughs> patronizing and annoying. And I, I uh, just like these stories coming out about him giving Marcus Streaman advice and like the tweet where he's like, yeah, we taught. Uh, like, look at them teaching Xavier Watts to do the alley oop interception. Like, such a well coached team. Like, dude, <laughs> your 15 minutes is up. And um, I don't know who they're playing this week, but I am betting the house <laughs> on that team. <laughs> who do you think was in front of a camera more last week? Thomas Hammock, Kamala Harris, or Donald Trump? Hammock, easily. Him <laughs> and his braces. He was on every single television show, podcast. He was everywhere. Now, Grant, I understand that Northern Illinois had a bye, 
But he made sure to milk every last ounce of that win. And I actually like that first on the field press conference, like obviously I hated it in the moment, but I was like, okay, like that's genuine. But then just the media storm no. that happened after, and then the the patronizing nature of it, I was like, all right, I can't live in a world where the head coach of Northern Illinois is telling me and the rest of the Northern fan base why I should actually be happy with what Marcus Freeman and his team put out there against the Huskies. Yeah, the head coach of Northern Illinois, who is 26 and 33 in six years, and NIU fans wanted him fired before this season. Yeah, that guy, that guy is the patronizer. It's it's just lovely. Anyways. That guy probably has a Charlie Weiss 10-year deal now, just from that one win. <sighs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, and like, it's not a hard place to win. Dave Dorn has had success there. Rod Carey has had success there. Jerry Kill has had success there. He is not a good coach, I, but anyways, and I'd never want to say his name again. <laughs> okay. Well, who knows? They might be in the playoff this year. All right, my last thing. This is a quick gripe. Got to complain a little bit about the broadcast. And uh, to be clear, I understand that doing that game, uh, doing any game when the the score is 42 to nothing at halftime is going to be a tough to call. And Brad Nessler is one of the best play-by-play voices of all time. And I generally like Gary Danielson. But they absolutely mailed it in <laughs> on this one. So they had a couple, like, absurd mistakes. They called Steve Angeli the Sun Bowl MVP multiple times, even though they were the ones who called that game. And I think eventually they corrected it and got Jordan Face on. They called Junior Tui Alamaka a true freshman. He's a junior. They called Luke Talich a true freshman. He is a redshirt freshman. And I understand that calling a blowout like that is hard, but there were multiple points where I'm like, are they even watching? And yes, there's always going to be a storytelling component in, in a blowout like that. But it also just feels so weird that that crew is not commentating the biggest SEC game every week. So maybe they're just like, screw it. We have to do Big Ten games now that aren't even like the premier Big Ten games. So they just mail it in. But it felt weird to have such a bad broadcast from a group that is normally like on their stuff at all the time. Yeah, it might be time for those two to to hit a retirement community and just play pickleball because uh, that was bad. Um, and you you didn't even mention the two worst ones, which I didn't realize in real time until because I was kind of not really having the sound on. And then I went back later that night and watched one uh, Kenny Minchie's touchdown run. And that's Don Schuler running in the touchdown <laughs> there. I forgot about that. <laughs> How did and I then, forget that one? And then the worst one was when Mitch Jeter was lining up to kick a field goal, and they're talking about Notre Dame last week. And after the last week's loss to Illinois State, no, if, <laughs> if we lost to Illinois State, we should burn down the university, okay? <laughs> like, if NIU wasn't bad enough, like I, I actually was really upset when I heard Illinois State what on if, that call. What if they said Western Illinois? That would have been the I mean, true tagger. Then, yeah. then I know they'd be listening to the show, but yeah, yeah I just we're like, clean it up. Yeah, that was a tough one from them, but I don't know. Again, it's it's just not the same with them not calling SEC yeah. games anymore. You got any uh, initial thoughts on Miami of Ohio before we let go? Yeah, I mean, I was just in Oxford uh, actually this past week, so I had some early scouting. Um, my girlfriend went there, so we – Went out in Oxford Thursday night, which um, first time there, lovely campus. Um, definitely felt old. Um, and I will say that Friday morning, walking around there, just seeing a handful of signs advertising that they were playing Cincinnati the next day at home. It's not quite the same atmosphere uh, that you feel on a football Friday in South Bend. Um, but I don't know. I also watched their game on Saturday. They looked really bad, but I'm sure that Chuck Martin will have them <laughs> raring to go come Saturday. Like the punter, if you haven't seen this yet, Look up the dropped snap that the punter had in that game against Cincinnati. It is one of the worst football plays I've ever seen. But, um, you know, hopefully the Irish come out motivated and hopefully the crowd is ready to go. I know it's not easy to get up from Miami of Ohio, but, man, I don't want another one where this is a, a dogfight in the fourth quarter. Yeah, and this is your first game since Texas A&M. That's kind of a long break for you. It is. Yeah. So first home game of the year, probably the latest I've gotten to South Bend in a year. And I don't know how long. So um, yeah, should be a good weekend. Looks like nice weather. All right. Looking forward to talking to you again next week. Hopefully we're in a little bit better spirits than these past two weeks. I have a good feeling, but I don't want to jinx it because Notre Dame was not prepared for Maxson last time. Hopefully mm -hmm. they figure it out this time around. Yeah, absolutely. 
Today's episode is also brought to you by Fandle. You've heard me talk a lot about Fandle, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little bit different for you today. So now through September 22nd, you only have a week left. All Fandle customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then, with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. I honestly cannot recommend this enough. I've had YouTube TV for years now. It's great, affordable, and this Sunday ticket option makes it that much better. What's better than watching your favorite team play every Sunday? The ability to tune in to any other game you want to watch to check in on your fantasy team to make sure that they're getting a win as well. Football season is here. I am so excited, and FanDuel allows you to get in on the action like never before. Just visit FanDuel.com to download America's number one sportsbook. All right, that's a wrap for this episode. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. Tomorrow, we officially turn the page to Miami, Ohio, so make sure you tune in for that. Also wanted to remind you that I'm doing another mailbag on Friday, so get your questions in. You guys sent in some really good ones last week, so let's keep that rolling this week as well. You can submit yours in the YouTube comments or send them to me on social media. The X account is at Locked On Irish, or you can send them in on Instagram at Locked On Irish Pod. Also, remember to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast. And for your second listen, check out Locked On College Football with host Spencer McLaughlin. I'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place.